set it for record. Okay, you can start. You can start. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hi, Shivali. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. This, uh, very, very important, very requested, very relevant session on dental health problems as we go through menopause. It is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Shivali, Captain Shivali Sharma Kerkar, to this very, very exciting session. Uh, Dr. Shivali is a dentist. She's been practicing for over 20, 26 years in Pune. She is the CEO and founder of Complete Dental Care Clinics in Pune and across Pune uh, in, on MG Road and in NIBM. And um, she graduated from Pune and then joined the Army, Med Army Dental Corps in 1995. She did short service commission. And uh, since then, she has focused her interest on uh, smiles, on, uh, and she's a, an expert in uh, zirconium caps. She is uh, an amazing fitness freak. She has participated in a plankathon for the Guinness Book, Book of World Records. She is a runner up of Mrs. Uh, Exquisite. Uh, and she is exquisite. She is one of the most gorgeous and beautiful women I have seen. And she's a super fitness freak. And she is an ideal, ideal example for all of us going through menopause on how to keep our, uh, not just our dental health, but our physical health, our beauty, our uh, charisma, our charm, and, uh, you know, our lovableness intact. So welcome, Dr. Shivali. Good evening, Dr. Nilima, and uh, great health to all of you. <laughs> so before we start, um, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Shivali, um, you recently completed your fellowship in forensic odontology. Um, what made you decide to study forensic odontology? Uh, actually, uh, I always had an inclination towards uh, criminology and studying criminology. And then sometime back, there were a few cases like the Nirbhaya case where a dental uh, specialist was called to exactly find out the, uh, the age of the person accused. So that got me very interested in uh, forensic odontology. It dates uh, back, but it was never documented nicely, like Hitler's uh, body was found in a very bad state. And just because of his front two fake teeth. It was actually his dentist who was called and he's the one who recognized it and he said, yes, this is Hitler's body. Also, uh, they are things like the Motor Vehicle Act, which is Indian Penal Code 320, which says that if it is somebody's fault or somebody causes an accident and your tooth breaks, it is a grievous injury. Now, these things, I think most of the dentists also would not know. That is how much important teeth are in the um, Indian law itself. Like if you lost a tooth or if you have fractured a tooth because it is an irreversible injury, it comes under grievous injury. And the punishment for causing such an injury can be uh, as much as seven years and uh, 2.5 lakh as compensation. So these are things which I think Forget about the common man, the dentist also would not know. I was also having a few domestic violence cases wow. where I thought I could help the people by uh, going through this. But basically, it was purely out of interest. And I'm very intrigued how uh, teeth can be used to find the age. And the, so precisely, that is what interests me the most. So you were, I remember when we were discussing menopause and osteoporosis, um, not a lot of dentists know that you can diagnose you can diagnose osteoporosis from a woman's dentition and her dental and oral health. Can you tell us some you know some case studies or case notes uh, from your uh, practice that alerted you to the fact that menopausal women actually have quite serious oral health issues? Because you, you have quite a large base of women uh, in the 40 to 60 age group, I remember you saying. Yes, yeah. it was comprised of almost 60% of all my cases. Wow. The first thing we do when a patient comes to us is we take a full mouth OPG. So just by looking at the OPG. What's an OPG? Sorry. Oral pentamogram. Uh -huh. That's a full mouth. It's on a plate. You get to see all the teeth on one sheet of plate. Right, right. So just by looking at it, it is uh, so obvious that how a male's jaw does not age much with time, 
but a female's jaw almost becomes chalky as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's nobody pushing her to go to the dentist. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, everybody is busy with their own life. So she's the one who has to take care of her own thing. Now, things like a burning mouth syndrome is a perimenopausal thing. But then before the bone loss, this syndrome starts almost three years before actual bone loss occurs. So a lot of women come to us with a burning mouth syndrome. Uh, women generally between the age of 40 and 50 come with burning mouth syndrome. And in them, when this so x-ray is just, taken... Um, just Can you just explain for the help of our audience what this burning mouth syndrome feels like for a woman? Yeah. So it is, a, it is a, a group of two, three symptoms where the tongue starts feeling a little sore. You cannot take spices well. The inner mucosa of the cheek starts feeling a little sore. Uh, you suffer from xerostomia. But at this stage, bone loss has not started. This starts almost three years before actual bone loss starts. Mm -hmm. So if such ladies are sent to a gynecologist on time, if required, if hormonal therapy is started, then uh, menopausal degeneration of bone is almost a irreversible process then. Mm -hmm. But if you neglect this sign, this is the very first sign, it invariably goes to a, a irreversible sort of bone loss. After the burning mouth syndrome, say a woman neglects it, doesn't do anything about it, doesn't take folic acid or vitamin B12, then this goes into bleeding gums, where the gums start to bleed. This happens after a few years. So our body gives us time to recoup from all this. But if we don't see the obvious signs, then obviously it doesn't recoup. So then we go to a bleeding gums. Eventually, uh, we, we feel sensitive teeth. Then there is bone recession. Then we see gaps between the teeth. And then finally, the teeth become shaky. And that's when the dentist can't help you. But this entire thing is spread almost over seven to eight years. Yes? Yeah. So... Um, <clears throat> So uh, I, I think uh, the dentist is the first person who really looks into your mouth and could tell you, yes, you're going, you're perimenopausal and you need to see a gynecologist as well as a dentist together. Many women, you know, they, I mean, you have a, in, in your women, you find that actually they're more empowered to see the dentist, but somehow in my patients, I've noticed that they're very reluctant to go to a dentist. Um, most women don't get help for their dental problems until it's too late or, you know, um, they end up with, I mean, I have so many friends who ended up with dental extractions or I have two aunts, you know, in their seventies who they went to a dentist and, you know, they had carious teeth or whatever. And the dentist recommended just take all your teeth out and we'll put implants in. And of course they had all their teeth removed. And then when they went to get the implants done, their jaw was so unhealthy that no implants could be put. And it had got so eroded that even dentures are really uncomfortable, painful, because obviously the mouth is so dry and sensitive that they can't tolerate dentures. And they ended up looking really old and haggard. Now, uh, my um, question for you is, um, this, this severe loss in the jawbone, especially the lower jawbone, can you explain a little bit to the audience why it is different, why it's not the upper teeth and it's the lower jaw and how does the face change? How does the facial structure change because of the changes in the lower jaw? The so upper they jaw is... Uh, they, they, they couldn't have these implants, you know, they, this reassurance oh, they implants and they couldn't. No, okay. there's just two, okay. no bone. There was no bone uh, strong okay. enough to hold the implant. Okay. So the upper jaw, that is the maxilla, is a type of spongy uh, jaw. Mm -hmm. It has got a lot of blood supply in it and uh, the teeth are well supplied with blood, which means the capillaries are obviously more than which we see in the lower jaw. The lower jaw is a more uh, calcified type of jaw, which means the organic matter in the lower jaw is more compared to the inorganic matter. In the upper jaw, it is the reverse. It has more of inorganic matter and less of organic matter. So because the vascularity of the lower jaw is poor, 
especially in the lower front teeth. Those are the first teeth a woman finds, they become shaky. That is the lower front teeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, when these teeth become shaky, say you have a timely intervention, you give the person an antibiotic, you take care of the bone condition of the person, you supplement vitamins, then the progression to the rest of the lower jaw actually stops. I have seen that happening. It's almost 100% that it stops. Right. If a person is losing teeth, I think it's the failure of both the patient and the dentist because they are basically organs. They were meant to last you till the last date. You're supposed to carry them along with you to the grave. You're not supposed to leave them behind in the dustbin of the dentist. <laughs> yes. I think it's a really sad thing, somebody losing teeth. Yeah. I myself, I think I must be doing just around two extractions in a month. And I, I it, it, it is a, it is a, almost an indication of success, the lesser extractions you do, because that means you could save everything. So, and it feels good to save it. When the patient comes to you in a sad state and says, everybody has said extract it and you say, no, I can still save it. It's a great feeling. Yeah. Everything I think can be restored. I have seen my patients who had come to me 20 years back. I have done a checkup for them. Every six months they come and all they need is a cleanup. I have never extracted or done a filling after that. Once they had an overalling done, it was like a complete revamp. And then they were good to go for like, but then they are extremely uh, loyal. Firstly, they are good patients who listen to everything you say. The instructions are very well followed. You said something about uh, uh, antibiotics, the different antibiotics, because one of the things I've been studying recently was uh, is the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, and the vaginal microbiome. And a lot of this microbiome changes at menopause, you know, because of dropping estrogen levels. But it also changes because of broad spectrum antibiotics. And I mean, personally, uh, recently also, I went through a tooth problem. I was diagnosed with periodontitis, which was a real shock for me because I've been eating and drinking so healthy over the last two to five years. I would never have expected that uh, I would have any kind of tooth problems. And uh, recently, uh, the dentist also diagnosed some sort of root infection. And I was given Augmentin, which is a very broad spectrum antibiotic. And yes. I was quite shocked, you know, because like, I put so much effort into restoring my microbiome and getting it optimal. And then just to take antibiotics for this. I mean, I was in a lot of pain, so definitely the pain went away. So I was relieved. But you have a different approach to managing periodontitis infections. Can you just tell the audience a little bit and maybe some dentists who are attending as well, what your approach is? Uh, there are almost 20 species of uh, bacteria in the mouth mm -hmm. and the number of bacteria, the, these are different species and the number is almost 10 raised to the power 10. Mm -hmm. Our aim is never to reduce the number of bacteria. Our aim is just to have a good equilibrium between the bad bacteria and the good bacteria. Now, there are some good ones that like lactobacilli, uh, streptococcus salivaris. These are the good bacteria. And then there are the bad ones which cause periodontitis like P. gingivalis and P. Uh, forceta. So uh, when you give a broad spectrum antibiotic, which is uh, killing the gram positive, gram negative, aerobic, anaerobic bacteria. So for some time, you will almost have a sterile mouth mm -hmm. for the next five days because that's just the span of antibiotic you give it. There is no surety that they'll recolonize in the way you want them to. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessary that you, can, you will be able to maintain that balance between the good and bad bacteria. So that has never been my approach. In fact, they say that dentists should always stay away from using antibiotics left, right, and center. Because uh, firstly, the patient becomes resistant to a lot of other infections for which they could be used. Now, so the general rule that I follow is I give the patient doxycycline, especially for periodontal infections. We start with 200 mg, which means a capsule in the morning, a capsule in the evening, which lasts for three days till the acute phase is uh, controlled. But then I continue with doxycycline 100 milligrams almost for 25 days okay. so that it slowly and obviously we change the oral habits. We clean all the teeth. You are trying mechanically to remove all the bad bacteria. You're removing plaque. You're giving the patient a good oral rinse. You're asking the patient to floss. 
So finally, the equilibrium gets maintained well. So our aim, which generally it is, is never to, and uh, most of the patients land up with stomach upsets, mm. severe gastritis after a augment and duo, they do land up with all these things. Sometimes we uh, give uh, high amoxicillin doses with metronidazole. So mm. I think these should be just reserved to a very few cases. Most of the cases can be managed by using uh, subtle antibiotics like doxycycline. Mm -hmm which do not even cause gastric irritation, actually. Yes. And like, uh, when we want to repopulate, like we, for gut, for the gut, we give prebiotics, probiotics. We ask the patient to have a high fiber diet. Um, so like, uh, what is what is different about the mouth? Do we need to do anything different to restore the oral microbiome? No, to tell you the truth, there's no food which will help you re restore the oral microbiome. Mm -hmm. It is just the oral hygiene that has to be good. So you are trying and achieving what was there before you landed up with menopausal gingivitis. Right. So your oral hygiene has to be excellent. And with a mild antibiotic, you get there. So the, but there is no food as which uh, causes miraculous uh, changes in the microbiome. No, there isn't. And uh, unlike, uh, uh, I mean, if you are asking the patient to take curds and all, it really doesn't help. I mean, in the middle, I remember there was this whole spate. You know, we've seen how the advertisements for, for toothpaste has changed. I mean, there was a huge trend in between for all these antiseptic toothwashes and for triclosan in the toothpaste. And, you know, now everybody's like, have this herbal toothpaste, herbal toothpaste. So what is the truth really with toothpaste and mouthwashes? You know, are they recommended? Are they not recommended? And are herbal toothpaste everything that they're cut out to be? What should people be using at menopause? Because I suppose a woman's mouth is very different to, uh, you know, for men probably it doesn't matter because they have a constant source of testosterone. It doesn't swing up and down like women's does. I mean, women go through quite, um, and, and I want you to talk a little bit about pregnancy as well, but women go through a lot of these fluctuations of hormones, not just, you know, at menopause and pregnancy, but through their regular cycle as well. There's peaks of estrogen and progesterone, you know, as you go through your normal menstrual cycle as well. So um, what is the role of these kind of toothpaste and mouthwashes, particularly for women? We'll talk about the mouth rinses first because suddenly everybody is using them extensively. So uh, anything which has alcohol in it is not a good idea for the mouth, although it is used extensively because as we have seen with hand san sanitizers now that it dries up the hand completely. So it would obviously play havoc in the mouth also. So absolutely no alcohol-based uh, mouth rinses. Uh, Triclosan was uh, looked very promising when it came into the market, but soon they found out that there's a relationship between triclosan and thyroid metabolism in the body. Also, they said that it reduces spermatogenesis, and there have been known cases of extreme allergy in children, including bronchitis, if they use triclosan. So there are a lot of brands who withdrew the word triclosan from most of their products. So I, I really think that these were not well studied. They were just, they just got excited when they found this product and they got it in the market. Uh, chlorhexidine is an extremely safe mouth rinse. Uh, according to every patient, the dilution could be varied. It is not an alcohol-based mouth rinse. So it does not dry the mouth. Our basic intention, uh, which we have for all uh, postmenopausal women, is to fight xerostomia. So, obviously, an alcohol based mouth rinse is an absolute no. Regarding toothpaste, uh, the toothpaste has to be FDA approved. Now, there's something called a particle size in a toothpaste. Mm -hmm. The particle size has to be small because the enamel is just like a glazed glass surface. If you have something really rough abrading, it almost becomes like frosted glass. So that particle size has to be approved. Unfortunately, in a lot of herbal paste, the particle size used is very large. So there's a lot of damage done to teeth. I mean, patients come and they say, yes, I used a very good herbal paste in my mouth. And then you tell him, oh yeah, but there are no teeth left. There are only roots left. 
because the herbal paste has eroded all the teeth. So uh, I think they should just stick to brands which are known and which have a approval seal on them. You can't use just anything or make something or use charcoal uh, rough fibers or there's a trend to use burnt tobacco in Maharashtra for some reason. Now, these are all highly abrasives. Mm. Uh, as a person ages, the enamel uh, width reduces. So we need to uh, save whatever little enamel is left. Now, regarding the facial changes you were saying, the nasolabial fold in women suddenly becomes more prominent mm. because the lower jaw almost collapses in a woman. They are because of two or three reasons. The first reason is during pregnancy, she might be having a lot of acid reflux. So her teeth have normally become very soft. So as she eats, as time goes on, the vertical height reduces mm -hmm. and it looks like the mouth has collapsed. That increases the amount of fold. Now, if you're injecting a Botox or doing something like that, that is not the treatment for it. The facial height has to be increased. Similarly, a lot of women during menopause do not sleep well and they have a problem of bruxism in the night. So that is again something which wears out teeth drastically. And if you're using obviously a, a, a herbal paste without uh, thinking much about it, then that is again a highly abrasive thing. So nothing which abrades your teeth. Firstly, I think brushing itself is a... a not a normal phenomenon. There's no other animal who brushes. The only reason we need to brush is because our fibrous food is pretty bad. Yeah. But we cannot use uh, extensive force or extensive abrasion. Otherwise, we do more damage to the teeth and there's no way that can be restored back. You were talking uh, also about um, uh, the mouth being the window to our health. And um, you mentioned about how uh, you know, pretty much every illness in the body can be viewed through the mouth. Can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, the different kinds of illnesses that can be seen in the mouth and particularly um, uh, about diabetes and hypertension and heart disease? Because I talk a lot about in my menopause classes about risk of diabetes, uh, heart disease, etc. But can you also point out how the oral health contributes to heart disease and diabetes and how diabetes, heart disease, etc. affects the oral health? You're very right. It is almost a two-way traffic. Uh, all 90% of systemic diseases are manifested in the mouth. So you see them in some way or the other. There are a lot of patients who come in for the first time, they come to know that they've got a high blood pressure by the way they bleed when I inject them. They won't know it before that. Or the way they bleed after an extraction is done. So, and they are unaware of it. So you tell them to get a blood checkup done and it's for the first time that they realize they have a problem. Now, diseases like subacute bacterial endocarditis, they have said that it is a, it's got a strong connection to poor oral hygiene. Mm -hmm. Because bacteria from the socket go into the bloodstream and then finally get deposited on the lining of the heart. Same way, a lot of cardiovascular diseases are caused because oral bacteria cause inflammation of arteries. So there's more of plaque formation in these inflamed arteries, leading to a, a heart attack later on. Also, pneumonia could be caused because the bad oral bacteria are sick, sucked into the lungs. So this was how uh, your bad oral hygiene could cause systemic problems. And if you explain it to the patient, I don't think like most of the patients would uh, know that. Like, So uh, the other thing is that there are a lot of uh, medicines given to the patients, mm -hmm. like, um, uh, like antihistaminics, uh, like decongestants, or uh, chronic, uh, for chronic problems, some painkillers, which cause complete xerostomia of the mouth. So that has to be taken into consideration. They are calcium channel blockers, which cause fibrosis of the gums. They have to be given in conjunction with folic acid, always 400 microgram of folic acid. If it is not done, then you have severe uh, lesions seen in the gum tissue. So that's why a dentist needs to be in constant touch with the family physician of the patient. Mm -hmm. 
because then they can make sure that he's in a good state. Otherwise, you go to solve a problem and then something else goes back. Mm -hmm. There are diseases like diabetes mm -hmm. and uh, uh, autoimmune diseases and uh, also diseases uh, which cause um, candidiasis in the mouth. So a lichen planus would be seen more in a person who's diabetic and has a high blood sugar than in another person. So these diseases are again manifested in the mouth. It is true that it is a doorway to uh, the entire body. I think with diabetics, you know, a septic focus in the mouth can also upset the diabetic control. Uh, yes. This is a known reason for why some diabetics may find that their sugar levels are very high and in spite of taking medication, you know, it's not getting solved. You were also talking about how, you know, we've got certain ducts that go from our eyes um, some ducts that go from the ears into the throat. So how does your oral health affect the health of your eyes and ears, etc. also? Uh, whenever, uh, generally, uh, most of the uh, uh, eye surgeons always send the patient for a dental checkup before they undergo an eye surgery. That also holds true for any procedure in which there is uh, general anesthesia involved because the patient is intubated. We do not want shaky teeth mm. to be lodged into the pharynx or into the airway. And uh, also uh, an eye surgery, once it's done, the healing could take longer if the oral hygiene is bad. These are all known documented things and uh, that's why it's very important to first treat a patient and then automatically he heals well from other surgeries as well. Mm -hmm. Even a, I mean, even an open heart surgery. Wow. If his oral hygiene is good, then he would heal better uh, with an open heart as well. Right, right. Otherwise, you might just by incub while incubating, uh, intubating the patient, you might just... Uh, land up knocking one of his teeth inside, then it becomes a totally messy procedure all by itself. Yes, yes. Loose dentures, loose teeth, loose crowns, they could all be lodged in the airway during these procedures. Yes. Mm. Uh, we were talking about the um, a difference between ma a male and female oral mm -hmm. hygiene. I would like to just talk a little about that. Yes. Um, so when a child is born, the first thing they noticed was that a child who is born by a normal delivery would be less susceptible to caries than a child born by a C-section. Because during that time, the oral flora is established. Before that, there is no oral flora in a child. Mm. So um, after that, when the teeth erupt, the streptococcus, which is there, there's only streptococcus salivaris when a child is born, that changes into streptococcus mutans and sanguis. Now, in a male, it ends here. And generally in his life, most things are quite well regulated. Yeah. But this does not happen with females. <laughs> so in the case of a female, when she reaches puberty, uh, estrogen plays havoc with her body. She lands up with bleeding gums. There's folic acid deficiency. There's vitamin B12 deficiency. So at that time, she needs to see a dentist. When she's pregnant, she suddenly has an acid reflux. So I would re uh, I, I generally recommend them to visit a dentist in their first or second trimester when they are comfortable on the chair, not in the third trimester when the damage has happened and you can't even be breathe properly and you're asking the dentist to do something for you. Most x-rays are impossible during that time. And then the third time is she needs the dentist again is when she hits menopause. So uh, women have constantly changing uh, flora in the mouth. And uh, I think uh, they they suffer more because of that. Men's uh, hormone levels tend to stay steady. <laughs> they they do dip, I guess, but marginally. Yeah, I suppose uh, uh, with men, I think now with women as well. Like you were talking about the mishri, you know, the burnt tobacco and stuff. But generally, nowadays also girls and women they have more tooth damage because of smoking and alcohol as well. It's not just and this whole new trend, you know, of uh, drinking juices, fruit juices. Uh, 
uh, how does that affect the teeth? I mean, I, I know somebody's mouth just smells like an ashtray when they've been smoking and it's not the most pleasant thing to have. But as a dentist, when you see somebody who's smoking, you know, what are the hallmarks, you know, both in men and women? I, I, I'm sure there are loads of women who smoke as well and who chew tobacco. There's actually a terminology called smoker's periodontitis. Now, the reason that happens is whether it's a man or a woman, uh, nicotine causes the shrinking of the width of the artery everywhere in the body, including the arterioles which supply the teeth. Right. So when there's less of blood going to the teeth, the teeth are more prone for becoming shaky or gum infection developing. So everybody who's a smoker generally has gum recession. If you see a smoker's teeth, they look slightly longer than a normal person's teeth because the gum and the bone both have shifted. It's not that they have become long, but the level of bone has gone down. So there's more crown portion, which is exposed. Mm -hmm. Alcohol, again, uh, dries the mouth. It's not good for women. It causes folic acid deficiency. So obviously it plays more havoc in a woman's mouth than a man's mouth. And um, with, uh, you know, um, we are, used to have a professor um, in our college who used to talk about our vulval health and oral health mirroring each other. And uh, very recently, we, me and Dr. Shraddha Valvekar, we had talked about vulvals, vulval changes. And one of the changes that happens in menopausal women particularly is a condition called lichen sclerosis. And of course, you know, there is a predilection for the vulval skin for HPV infections as well, you know, so the beginning of small lumps or lesions that can then become cancerous over time. So does something like that happen in the mouth as well? Because um, certainly I know that when, when I used to work in the geomedicine clinic, we checked for sexually transmitted infections, we checked the mouth as well, we took a history about oral sex, sexually transmitted infections, gon gonococcal infections in the fossa, chlamydia, um, you know, trichomonas vaginalis in the mouth. Um, but I'm sure that there's an oral preponderance of HPV as well. So um, what about oral cancers, secondary to HPV infection, smoking, lichen sclerosis, plaques? What sort of things do you see? Um, the, the more than all these things, it's a sharp tooth which predisposes a person for oral cancer. Anybody who's got a broken sharp tooth, and this is uh, the, uh, one of the S's among the sunlight, uh, the spirits, smoking, and sharp teeth. Right. These are a few of the predisposing things which causes. Uh, so the other diseases, they, are, they won't be seen so much. But a uh, sharp tooth is invariably a cause. Uh, there's a little lump which gets formed, or the tongue gets bitten initially, or the cheek gets bin, bitten initially especially in the third molar region. And then because of smoking or because of the spirits, uh, the lesion just keeps growing and ultimately it does need biopsy. A lot of patients who suffer from oral cancer, the only way uh, to help them is by sending them to an oncologist who ultimately does a commando operation. There is no other treatment really speaking. It is very sad to see how fast it develops how easily it can be detected, but uh, the patient soon loses the jaw or half the tongue or all the lymph nodes on that side. So yes, if you do uh, have a sharp tooth or a broken tooth anywhere in the mouth, that's the first uh, reason for concern. Uh, sunlight is something you can take care of. Smoking is something you can give up. But for the sharp tooth, you have to go to somebody. And there are people who roam around with lumps actually in their mouth and they're not worried about it because it's become a part of their mouth. They do play with it with their tongues. But if you ask them since when it is there, they won't even remember for how long they had it. Right. And it actually uh, progresses at a great speed. Right. So before you know it, it's become a full-fledged squamous cell carcinoma or something like that. So what is And the then there are other factors. What is an ideal frequency for women to be going to the dentist? I mean, uh, men don't experience so much hormonal changes, but women do, particularly through menopause. And because, uh, like you said, we want to take our teeth to the grave. We don't really want to be suffering with gum disease and tooth loss and periodontitis. I mean, it was a real shock for me. So uh, how frequently should women going through menopause 
be seeing their dentists and of course how can they tell their daughters and daughters in law to protect their teeth and gums uh six monthly visits are always good for either men or women there is nothing really which needs to be more close than that in six months uh, suppose you have just started with the symptoms of uh, gingivitis they are always the precursors of periodontitis so you can actually do something so fast that it just stops at one place but mm -hmm. six monthly uh, visits are a must right. and then uh, there are things which people don't know about like a water pick now a water pick is rather than using a mouth rinse a water pick is a, a jet of high pressure water mm -hmm. which is used to dislodge debris in the mouth so i mean these things have not entered the indian market but actually just using water and getting a perfectly clean mouth would be a great idea i wish people do I mean, there are very few people who are actually using flosses also, mm -hmm. but then if all these things are introduced, it would do really good. I mean, the patient himself would save money on the other visits mm -hmm. because his mouth is so clean. It's always a pleasure to see a, a good, clean mouth. Really speaking, even to the dentist. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I was saying recently, my uncle um, he has really bad teeth. He's always had bad teeth. even ended up with an angioplasty way back in 2003 and he was so reluctant to uh, go and see a dentist to fix his teeth you know and um i was saying to him i said it's so important that two things your eyes and your teeth it's like you cannot compromise on the care you give to them and once you find a really good dentist or a good ophthalmologist you don't let go of them and i know your patients are your total like they are raving fans because they get spoiled mm -hmm. and um they absolutely appreciate you know how kind and compassionate and joyful you are when you see them and how gently you treat them because that is the biggest fear most people are going to the dentist like my god i'm going to sit there i'm going to have my mouth open i'm going to be in this vulnerable position and somebody is going to cause me pain so that is such a you know it's hugely creditable to you can you talk a little bit more about this fear that people have for dentists and how they should choose their dentist and uh, what should be their criteria for uh, feeling safe when they go to a dentist um the first criteria to start with is uh, that the waiting for a patient should not be too much you you can't if you have 20 people sitting in the waiting room it doesn't mean that the dentist is successful it just means that yes things have been coming out he has been doing that every day they have not sustained for long and that's why he's got so many people coming back for it so um you, your waiting time should be less because i mean most of the patients don't even sleep before they go to the dentist the day before they go to the dentist it is uh, and it's a very personal thing so you have to have a very good rapport between uh, the it's very necessary to listen to their problems there may be bigger issues in their mouth which they do not think are big they might have come to you for the issue i generally try and solve that before i tell them the bigger issues because it is necessary to do what they have come for because uh, they are uh, obviously disturbed by that little thing so there may be a person who's got uh, very bad staining who has to uh, be uh, going for his marriage but who's got all broken teeth behind and is not worried about them mm -hmm. so yes to that patient i cannot say no you have broken teeth and i will treat those first and i'm not going to touch your this so it has to be a very compassionate thing plus he is allowing you to work in an area which is absolutely uh, now going to be your domain and opening uh, everybody knows i think even every dentist knows that opening uh, your mouth in front of another person is it's a difficult job to do there are injections which are given directly in the mouth so i think a soft hand and a kind heart go a long way in treating the patient they say that words treat more than the real treatment so there there's a very nice saying that says your trust in you helps me heal you better Yeah. If you do not trust me, then there's very little chance that I can heal you well. Yes. And um, you've been like you know you went through this pageant, this beauty pageant, and fitness. 
how has this helped you in your practice as a dentist and over the years how has your fitness helped you i mean how has dentistry changed you and how have you uh, experienced dentistry as your practice you know with being the kind of person you are Uh, that uh, dates back all the way till the, from the time i was in the army so fitness entered life during that time only when i was still serving in the army so you need to be fit to get your next promotion and to not uh, be superseded by somebody so that was yes the starting point of it secondly i did understand that if you are mentally uh, happy which you are if you are physically happy it's all related so you get up with a good uh, smile on your face and you go to work because you want to go in for work and nobody is forcing you to and obviously the result which is produced is much greater than uh, if you're going with a back if you're going with a knee pain or a back pain then you might compromise on something or the other so yes uh, i think everybody who has a standing job like a surgeon or a dentist needs to be 100% fit so these are the things like the blanket thon which was organized by bajaj alliance or the mrs exquisite they were just fallouts of this uh, healthy thing but it becomes a habit it becomes a life goal you just do it because you want to be mentally and physically uh, available to the patient actually all the time so if you are irritable then obviously you would not like to pick up the phone or things like that but if you are in a good frame of mind and you tell the patient yes give me a call at 3 o'clock in the night i'll surely uh, take care of your dental problem it's a big uh, mental support to the patient also so it helps you as well as it helps everybody around you and how did you change and how has your practice changed because of covid um actually all dental practices changed in the year 1995 and 96 when hiv came in a big way to tell mm-hmm. you the truth okay okay so uh, before that most of the dentists that is before the 1990 most of the dentists were recycling gloves or suction tips or other things it's at that moment when hiv hit the dental fraternity in a big way or hepatitis b as well that we learned that whatever has to go in the mouth has to go in the dustbin after that there's no recyclable stuff at all which you can have in a dental surgery mm-hmm. so that follows even now we do follow that protocol and that helps us with covid times as well but the fumigation of the dental surgery even after every patient if possible that's what i try and do calling less of patients every day giving them longer appointments so i would work on one patient for almost one and a half hours rather than calling him five times and exposing him to other patients mm. the third thing i followed was that there should be one per- patient sitting on your chair one in the waiting and one on the way to clinic that's just how the rule has to be so that these three people really never meet each other and there's never an infection transfer then obviously we all are vaccinated and we've taken all precautions but yes between patients that thing of not uh, having 10 people sitting outside and allowing them to uh, get very close to each other that protocol is completely followed and yes our bio waste has increased because of that but it's okay it's, patients are on top priority yes yes because once you when you have tooth pain you really can't think of anything else it is one of no, the and, uh, you can't in, yes and in the lockdown people have suffered a lot actually because they were not used to cleaning the house or being by themselves not having house help so i've had strangely a lot of fracture cases during this time people have fallen down right. they are elderly people who were left alone so there were a lot of them who i mean they were people who chipped their teeth because they fell on water things like that they were exhausted and uh, yes we were there for them throughout even sometimes we just had to do give them medicines to reduce the pain till the time everything was good again but yes we had to be there for them because people were already suffering quite a lot yeah i never thought of that wow that's a lot i'll just let me see if you covered everything um 
TMJ. TMJ arthritis was something which um, a lot of women suffer with. You know, as you go through menopause, there's a lot of stress, anxiety. Not just that menopause is causing your stress, but many women may be going through separation or divorce, relationship issues. Uh, they may be going through significant job changes. Their children may be leaving home. So menopause in particular is a very stressful time. And I know certainly that uh, a lot of women suffer with uh, TMJ arthritis, uh, TMJ problems. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and what can be done to you know, alleviate some of the pain and difficulty with uh, TMJ problems? The upper and the lower jaw actually come in contact with each other only when we are chewing. Right. They do not touch each other when you're speaking. They do not touch each other throughout the day and they do not touch each other when you are asleep because there's a little bit of gap between your upper and your lower teeth always. Mm -hmm. But what happens uh, when a person has bruxism, he's, or he's in a high stress job, there are a lot of bank people who do suffer from bruxism mm -hmm. because they have to do extremely uh, ca ca calculations and all in which they have to be really, uh, they have to concentrate on their work or women who, or people who've got anger issues also show a lot of bruxism. You would find that the masseter is constantly clenched. Actually, it is visible from outside that the side of the jaw, the masseter is always tight and you can see that masseter. So the aim is to uh, relieve the jaw as much as you can. Obviously, if you ask a person, that do you do it? It's absolutely a subconscious thing. They would say, no, we do not do it. But the, the changes in the tooth morphology, instead of being a nice convex tooth, it suddenly becomes a concave tooth with a dip. Because it's basically that the upper teeth are almost eating into the lower teeth. Mm. So uh, you can't do much about them in the morning except to ask them to change their uh, way of living, to do some sort of meditation or do some de-stressing exercises but what really helps is to allow them not to grind their teeth in the night so for that a night guard or a bite plate is given which they are supposed to wear directly after they've brushed their teeth it's almost a transparent plate which is not visible so once you wear it it cushions the upper and lower teeth and does not allow them to grind with each other that immediately allows you to open your mouth a little, which has a very soothing effect on the condyle. Mm. So the fossa, which is worn out, eventually gets healed. But then calcium supplements and uh, uh, night guard have to be given together. And it takes a little while for this to happen. So it is not something which gets okay within uh, a week or a month because this is a long-standing habit. Right. So in the morning also then slowly, when they are made aware that please don't grind your teeth, however angry or tensed you are, yes, they do give it up eventually. <laughs> because basically they are actually eating up their own teeth. Yeah, yeah. yeah they do say, you know, getting angry with somebody else is like, uh, you know, swallowing your own poison, body. Swallowing poison and expecting somebody else. Yeah, to that's die. right. <laughs> poison of anger. Hmm. Uh, we talked about medication, systemic health, a little bit about sleep apnea and snoring because the mouth remains open. And I certainly have noticed that, you know, when I wear the mask also, my mouth tends to remain open. And I was recently uh, listening to Dave Asprey and he was talking about um, how a dry mouth, especially people who sleep with their mouth open at night can end up with oral infection that well, it helps yes. at the microbiome. And he is really strange, you know, because what he advocates is like closing, sleeping with your mouth taped. So you don't leave okay. it open. <laughs> okay. So all, all these problems are actually seen in the childhood itself. So right. there's a reason why a child is asked to have an adenoid operation done. I mean, an, we call it an adenoid phase, which is a very typical phase. It is a long phase with the poorly developed jaw mm. and the person is always uh, opens his mouth and sits. Eventually the lips become hypertonous, which means he develops thick lips 
and the oral hygiene is in a bad shape because of the dryness of the mouth because saliva itself is a great cleanser mm -hmm. you need to have the saliva flowing throughout it is like you are washing a floor every time and getting rid of the debris so in children adenoids and tonsillitis are treated very early so that they don't progress to rampant caries in children same way people who have sleep apnea or open their mouth too large so firstly you do send them to an ent and find out what is the reason why they are not able to breathe well from their noses uh, deviated nasal septum um, there are other problems which could be causing that but the only thing a dentist can really do for them is again to improve the condition of the mouth by giving a mouth rinse or there's something called a salivary wafer which increases the amount of salivary flow in the mouth hmm. but there's nothing as such which can be done so that he closes his mouth the the only the predisposing conditions have to be eliminated and then you hope that uh, so a mouth guard could help which actually the 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 way you would have seen people who are boxers they wear mm -hmm. a mouth guard inside mm -hmm. so we do fabricate mouth guards it's a better version than putting a tape on the mouth <laughs> so we do cover the mouth so that it doesn't dry right but then it's actually oral hygiene which has to be improved yeah. quite a lot in these people because the mouth smells it gets yeah. dry it smells yeah a uh, a wet mouth is always a healthy mouth so if you are salivating well uh, you would have less of caries so if a person comes with a lot of caries that is the first thing told to them that your body is begging for liquids please furnish it because the mouth again shows that you are uh, deprived of liquids now an oral tartar is something you can clean easily with a scalpel but then you have to make the patient aware that this could also manifest as kidney stones sometime later on because basically all the bodily fluids are more viscous mm. it's not just your saliva it is your blood which is more more which could be more viscous because of the less of hydration in the body so it could lead to things like bile stones or kidney stone and those things can't be removed as easily as the oral tartar so yeah the patient eventually you just change his habit so he starts drinking more water i think we addressed um you were going to talk a little bit about tofu and phytoestrogen in menopause women so uh, when so, uh, menopause uh, soya and tofu and under the pretext that it's going to help i mean um as a menopause expert i know that there is very little evidence for uh, so called uh, alternative medicine herbal medication they just don't work as well as estrogen does um and in fact it's quite difficult to measure their effect because they don't they're not subject to the same rules and regulations pharmaceutical products have but you were talking a little bit about other problems with tofu that i'd like you to talk about a lot of menopausal women have gastric issues they have digestion problems tofu mm -hmm. is not such an easily digested thing firstly the relation about if you are taking in tofu is estrogen really secreted into the mouth the mouth does have estrogen beta receptor cells but uh, is uh, estrogen really secreted how much amount of that estrogen eventually uh, reaches the mouth that is uh, nothing which is uh, specified as yet plus if you are uh, giving a woman tofu then obviously you are increasing her gastric problems because it is a very difficult uh, food to uh, digest mm. uh, fermented foods are said to be uh, better than even fermented tofu is a much easier food to digest than soya milk or tofu although they have come into the market and everybody is fancying them mm. also uh, there is a relationship which is found that too much of estrogen is again not a good thing because it could cause carcinoma 
So I guess uh, tofu as such uh, should be taken in moderate amounts. It is not a very good thing to have tofu. And then it, it can't be done that you have too much tofu and finally it'll be secreted in the mouth. No. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there are other things like uh, hormonal therapy. After that, women have got their oral flora tested and they have found that after hormonal therapy or taking a B12 or taking a folic acid, the number of uh, periodontitis producing bacteria have considerably reduced. So these are absolute uh, proofs that we have. But with tofu, there are no, no solid proofs like that. So I don't think it was, that is the same story as triclosan. I think yeah. it's come new in the market. Everybody is excited about it. But eventually whether it works or not is highly questionable. Hmm. I think Phyto I think... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know the efficacy of that because uh, I have not heard also many gynecologists say that we start taking loads of soya milk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> because it's unregulated, you know, we don't know. A lot of soya that's manufactured nowadays is genetically modified. We really don't know the long-term effects of uh, genetically modified soya on our body. The other thing is when men increase a lot of soy intake, um, they don't really need it. They don't need phytoestrogen. So they can see problems like gynecomastia. They may have reduced libido, uh, lower testosterone levels, etc. Et and for women, um, uh, I certainly know, I have experience of women who take uh, soy supplements, protein shakes, etc. And, you know, I, I remember there was a lady I posted for a vaginal hysterectomy because she had a prolapse and she had a bulky uterus. And I remember she had taken two to three months of protein supplementation because the vaginal tissue was really bad. But her uterus has increased in size almost like to a 16 week size uterus by the time I actually did her procedure. And the only reason I could think about was that excess soy intake. There was an estrogenic effect of it. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Are there some tips you'd like to give menopausal women or women in general? Because you were going to talk um, a little bit about your regime for fitness and well-being as well. And what kind of things you would recommend for women? Now, firstly, uh, Dr. Nilima, I would tell every woman to make it a point. Like the whole ha the house, actually, she is the foundation of the whole house. So everything is just like resting on her. The moment she crumples, the whole uh, structure goes down. So she, and there's no way you can take care of others without taking care of yourself. Only if you are in a good state, can you have a smiling face and then you are cap capable of taking care of another. So I think every woman, whether she has a problem or not, must visit her gynecologist as well as a dentist whenever she can, especially after she's menopausal and not go uh, just for their uh, pain problems or sudden acute condition. Also, uh, a good uh, toothbrush, a good paste, a good mouth rinse, regular flossing, maybe use of water picks. These are things only a dental surgeon can show it to you. So it's always a good idea. I mean, I, I show people interdental brushes and they have never heard of this uh, concept as interdental brushes. Strangely, women develop spacing after menopause and an interdental brush is actually like a lovely appliance which they can use between their teeth to keep it absolutely clean. A normal toothbrush would not go. But then till the time, obviously you're not visiting a dentist, it's very difficult to uh, find that out. So if, if you're visiting somebody, uh, I am sure that uh, women between the age of 40 and 60 are one of the most confident women. And the confidence obviously improves drastically if they've got a lovely set of teeth to go with it. Uh, the con uh, Everybody's confidence uh, falls drastically if you have a problem, oral problem. There, there are people who won't even smile. Yeah. I have seen people change so drastically when the teeth were given to them and like I, I had not been able to recognize these people and it's not just their smile, the way they dress up, the way they talk to their spouse, the way they face the world with a good set of teeth is an absolutely, uh, uh, it, it's like, the, it's a, such a lovely uh, feeling to see them that way once you've done a total rehab. So I think they should really take very good care of them. It's sad to see that women don't take care of themselves the way they need to. And they suffer a lot because of it. 
I'm sure a great smile. I know you narrated the story of a lady who uh, had her teeth done with you, and suddenly she was like, "Wow, I can smile now." And when you saw her, she was a completely changed person, and the way she was talking with her kids and this, with her this husband. This lady was a photographer, strangely, and she was a foot. Uh, the the first lady I was talking to you about was a photographer. She's the one who tells everybody to smile nicely. and she had the teeth and she won't smile so every time i would talk to her crack joke she just won't smile so she became my patient and the moment all her treatment was done yes i did find a lovely picture on the facebook <laughs> with all her teeth flashing and yes i was talking about the other lady also who was very quiet the first time she came with her husband who didn't even look at him in the eye but uh, as soon as she underwent it was it's like a transformation it's like a makeover Yeah. so she was actually sitting and uh, being flirtatious towards him which was nice to see yeah. it was a lovely change it was like you've given them back their youth which is very nice yes yes that's wonderful i think that's all we have time for today thank you so much for coming and having this conversation about dental health oral health and for all the wonderful tips you've given to all of us to keep our teeth healthy and uh, to keep them intact to we end at the grave thank you so much um uh, did you want to check if there's any questions uh, on your um, page on your thing at all do you want to see if anybody is asking any questions it would take time to oh, okay so, okay it will we'll take a little that. while um, i'll put uh, i'll put dr shivali's uh, uh, your clinic phone number we can put in the comments and you can feel free to get in touch with her um you've got a clinic website as well dr shivali uh, no, i've got an email you could contact me on the email i'll give you both my clinic number and the email so okay. you could uh, message me and uh, i'm anyway available on just dial so if you just uh, write my name you would uh, be taken there wonderful that's got all the details <laughs> thank you thank so you much. so much dr nilima it was lovely talking to you it's a pleasure Thank you so much. Thank bye you. bye. Thanks a lot. Bye for the bye. bye.